What is the relationship between the spiritual work of the United Nations and the transformation of planetary consciousness? Dear friends, I'd like to begin this address by offering two keynote thoughts which I'd like to invite you to keep in mind as we consider this pivotal and potentially life-altering issue for all life on our planet. Both of these keynotes are taken from the Ageless Wisdom as presented by the Tibetan Master Jual Kul within the books authored by Alice Bailey. Firstly, speaking symbolically, when the United Nations has emerged into factual and actual power, the welfare of the world will then be assured. What is that welfare but love in action? What are right human relations but love among men, groups, and nations? What is international cooperation but love on a world scale? Those are the things which the love of God in Christ expressed, and those are the things which we are working here today to bring into being. We are attempting to do it on a vast global scale, and this in spite of opposition an opposition which can only temporarily succeed. Such is the potency of the awakened spirit of humanity. Secondly, within the United Nations is the germ and the seed of a great international and meditating reflective group, a group of thinking and informed men and women in whose hands lies the destiny of humanity. Their point of meditative focus is the intuitional or buddhic plane. As the dream that arose from a nightmare, the United Nations gave hope to the world at a time when people were in despair, pronouncing an end to the scourge of war and envisioning a world of justice, peace, and progress for all peoples of the earth. The United Nations has been called humanity's most far-sighted and significant undertaking. It was on April 25, 1945, that delegates from 50 nations met in San Francisco for a conference known officially as the United Nations Conference on International Organization. On the occasion of that first conference, Mary Esther Crump, a friend of an ABC radio correspondent reporting from San Francisco, was so inspired by the proceedings that she wrote a poem entitled The Song of the Seraph of San Francisco. Herein she wrote, And now, approaching our planet's night, one of the Lord God's seraphim comes, ambassador sent from him, to implement a cosmic plan on behalf of the family of man. The Ageless Wisdom tells us that even the Lord Buddha, the Lord of Wisdom, as well as the Christ, the Lord of Love, were lending their energies and their support at that critical time in our planet's history. The precarious, touch-and-go nature of that conference was described by Harold Stassen, one of the U.S. signatories of the United Nations Charter. He stated that the cynics, the negators, the doubters, and the Armageddonites among the public and the media were strident in their assertions that the 50 nations could never be brought to agreement and that a third world war by 1970 or 1975 was inevitable. He then gives the following account of how the tide was turned. As we began regular explanations to the media and to non-governmental representatives who increasingly came to San Francisco, public sentiment began to swing in a hopeful manner. Virginia Gildersleeve, one of the eight-member delegation from the United States, came forward with the preamble concept of We the People. From then on, progress in our work and in public opinion accelerated to the point where all 50 delegations agreed unanimously and two months later signed the 10,000-word charter on June 26. The chaos, uncertainty, and conflict swirling around the 1945 conference are with us yet today. Although there's been great progress within this organization, the challenges are yet many. 
The forces arrayed against the UN both from within and from without continue to eclipse, thwart, and render impotent its objectives and goals. The tension continues between the collective ideal that is the United Nations versus the limiting interests of individual member states. These forces of separativeness, selfishness, and greed are the common enemies of humanity, the enemies that would obscure and resist the working out of the plan of love and light on our planet. However, just as the collective ideal that is the UN has its detractors, so also does the UN have its supporters and those who strive mightily to realize the goals and objectives as set forth within the Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the many agreements and plans of action that have been formulated over the years to improve living conditions for the whole of humanity. Increasingly, many within the world community recognize the spiritual heartbeat of this global organization. Many of these individuals and groups recognize the symbiotic relationship between the plan of love and light that is the spiritual destiny of humanity and the goals and objectives of the United Nations. June 1945 was a pivotal time on our planet. The birth of the UN signaled the attainment of a critical benchmark in humanity's history and spiritual progress. It occurred at the same time that the Christ took over his duties and responsibilities as the spiritual teacher and leader during this dawning solar cycle of Aquarius. And it was also at this time that he was given permission from on high to release the great invocation to humanity, who through its efforts and victories during World Wars I and II, demonstrated its intention and ability to begin practicing right human relations. Along with cooperation, brotherhood, and synthesis, unity is a key concept and descriptor of the age of Aquarius. Thus even its name, the United Nations, links this organization to humanity's destiny, indicating also humanity's nascent attempt to open its collective heart center, providing the ability to bridge, to unite, and to relate. The recognition of brotherhood, a promise of the Aquarian Age, is clearly affirmed in the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Therein it is stated that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Of course, there are few who would question the ubiquitous violations of this article. However, increasingly, within the General Assembly and within its many specialized agencies and offices, the United Nations chooses the path of the common good, continuing in its promise and efforts to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom for all the world's people, as stipulated within its charter. Increasingly, the recognition is articulated that humanity is one, that anyone's threat is everyone's threat, and that the United Nations is the common house of humanity. Significantly, the United Nations Charter is written in the name of We the Peoples, the succession of secretaries-general who have presided over this organization have understood that it exists for and must serve the needs and hopes of all people everywhere. As such, the United Nations is clearly an Aquarian organization. Within the ageless wisdom, the collective center humanity is known as a lotus bud, since the dawn of humanity, only three petals of this lotus bud have opened, all having to do with humanity's development of creative intelligence. Today, because of its demonstrated achievements and the inspiration from the spiritual energies now available on our planet, 
humanity is beginning to open one of the inner petals of that lotus, the inner petal of love. What does this mean practically? Love inspires cooperation and unity. In its true and deepest sense, it is pure reason because it brings with it an indisputable recognition and understanding of the interdependent nature of all life and the interchangeableness of I and Thou. It inspires loving understanding and reveals, therefore, the scientific basis of brotherhood. The goals and objectives of the United Nations as set forth in its charter and in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are the very same aspirations, goals, and ideals of all the spiritual traditions of all time. The success and full functioning of the United Nations as set forth in these documents is the fulfillment and the realization of the hopes of all people of goodwill, not only of today, but of all ages. We live in an unprecedented time. Because of the extraplanetary and cosmic spiritual energies now uniquely available, and because of the growing maturity of humanity, these goals and hopes are no longer a utopian dream. They're not only abstract ideals, they are instead becoming programs and plans of action that are being implemented and slowly being realized in the day-to-day life. In the meditation outline that informs this initiative that we refer to as the spiritual work of the United Nations and the liberation of humanity, there's an opportunity to creatively reflect on the relationship between the work of the UN and the spiritual welfare of humanity on the needed planetary conditions that will allow humanity to realize its spiritual destiny and the ways in which the UN can help create these conditions. Nations like individuals must recognize their need for each other, develop mutual understanding and mutual helpfulness. Imagine the family of nations shouldering their responsibility for each other. Imagine the planetary conditions resulting from the humane and just sharing of the resources of the entire planet. Must not the welfare of the whole of humanity be the goal of interest and of effort for each and every one of us? Must we not seek the common good, the good of the whole, and not just the good of any one particular nation or group? A global spiritual civilization envisioned and worked for by all of humanity's greatest light bearers and spiritual teachers today is possible. The esoteric wisdom alerts us to the fact that all ashramic energy at this time is directed to the practical world affairs and to the education of the general public about the plan of love and light. And it is for this reason that the United Nations play such a pivotal role in the liberation of humanity and in the transformation of planetary consciousness. Doug Hammarskjöld, the second Secretary General of the United Nations, is often quoted for having famously proclaimed that there will be no peace on earth unless there is first a spiritual renaissance. To this purpose, he is known for having carefully overseen the refurbishing of the UN Room of Quiet, the UN Meditation Room, for which he wrote the dedication that is today posted as a plaque outside this meditation room. Therein he indicated that this room was to be a place where the doors may be opened to the infinite lands of thought and prayer, where people of many faiths will meet, And for that reason, none of the symbols to which we are accustomed in our meditation could be used. However, he said, there are simple things which speak to us all, such as the shaft of light striking the shimmering surface of solid rock, reminding us of how daily the light of the skies gives life to the earth on which we stand. A symbol to many of us of how the light of the Spirit gives life to matter. 
We are told in the Bible that the Christ, the Son of Righteousness, will bring the healing of the nations in his wings. Yes, the United Nations is part of a cosmic plan. Within its hands lies the destiny of humanity. And yes, as one of the spiritual teachers of humanity has indicated, the living organism of aspirants and disciples can provide a center of peace, power, and love, of practical help and spiritual uplift such as the world has not hitherto seen. Such is the hope. See you to it. Spiritually awakened people everywhere can support the United Nations as it strives to establish a world unity which will produce right human relations based on the rule of love wisdom, the rule of the soul. We can support this organization as it inspires the cultivation of sound government. Those governments who have the welfare of their citizens foremost in their minds We can support and strengthen its resolve to develop a new system of economics, meeting the basic needs of all, and based on the principle of sharing. We can participate in the development of a united spiritual effort, inspired by the hierarchy of love wisdom, and we can contribute to the creation of an enlightened world public opinion, so that the welfare of the world will in fact be assured. Thus, the spiritual mysteries can then once again be openly taught, and a knowing humanity will then become a willing participant in the transformation of planetary consciousness. The third volume of the Agni Yoga book, Super Mundane, calls on us to understand that cooperation with the highest is woven not from coercion, but from joy. This wisdom continues. What would our labor be without voluntary cooperation? A lone worker cannot succeed in all the worlds. It is beautiful when a friend, unasked, hastens to help with and continue the urgent work. True cooperation is hundred-eyed and hundred-armed. And with this one final thought from that same wisdom, I would like to close. Not without reason, it is said that each dream will at some time be turned into reality. Thus in calmness, one should think about heroic achievements. May we each dream and think heroically about how we might more perfectly cooperate with the greater plan of love, and light, so that we can help bring about the long-awaited planetary transformation of consciousness. Thank you for listening.